All right, hi everyone. So this is uh, how to build a home lab. And quick introduction and a, and a couple of points uh, before we proceed. So this was originally conceived as a four hour workshop for Circle CityCon. And I was asked to, uh, to bring it here as well. So, but we don't have four hours. So I condensed a lot of material into a one hour talk. Uh, so we, we cut out the demos and, uh, and cut back on some of the really nitty gritty technical details. But I'll be happy to answer questions afterwards or at the end if we have time. Um, I cover a lot of the stuff we need uh, to get started and that you'll need to, to get up and running. Uh, but if you do have any questions, feel free to come up to me afterwards. Uh, or, like, again, if we have questions uh, at the end, I'm happy to answer any of them. This was a, originally a partnership with uh, myself and Timothy DeBlock. Unfortunately, Tim couldn't be here this weekend. He just started a new job, which is awesome for him. But it also means that uh, you know they don't often want you leaving the state and taking a week off right after you start a new job. So uh, he couldn't make it out to, to Converge this year. Um, but uh, for I know he would want me to point out that uh, you can find him at, uh, at Tim DeBlock on Twitter. And he is our executive producer for PBCSEC, which I'm also one of the co-hosts for. Uh, and he used to be, he, he helped start up uh, before he moved out of South Carolina, a cola, a cola sec. So if you know someone out uh, that way, out Columbia, South Carolina, uh, there's a great group out there. And Tim also does the Exploring Information Security podcast where he'll, um, he's taking a, a break right now while he starts his new job. But uh, if you go back and look at the feed, there's lots of great interviews and discussions with various people from the community. Um, he did a really great uh, kind of historical uh, look back with Mubix and uh, MS0867, which is pretty cool. Uh, and then for myself, uh, my name is Chris Manalina. Uh, Tim was the blue team side of this talk. I'm the red team side. So a lot of my examples will be red team focused. Uh, but this is totally applicable whether you're blue team or red team. We're going to talk about how you can use your lab for learning all kinds of things, even if it's not something you do in your day to day. So this is, like I said, for everyone. Uh, you don't have to be a, a pro. Uh, you don't have to already be up and running with virtualization software. You don't even have to know what a VM is. Uh, we'll cover all of that. And it's pretty easy to get started uh, from the ground up. It's easy to add stuff to your lab. So it doesn't matter what your, what your level of expertise is. If you're a student, if you're just getting started, switching from another industry, uh, there's stuff in here and stuff you can do with a home lab that will be really beneficial to you. So again, for red and blue. And the key thing here to, a key thing I want you to take away is uh, kind of this, this tweet I went and dug up from Dave Kennedy is that everyone is new to something. The home lab will help you experience new things, things that you can't see in your environment, that you might not normally see, things you only hear about. You can set up a Windows machine that's patched at a certain level and play around with some new exploit if you're curious how it will affect machines back in your environment or how you can attack it using that, that new vulnerability. Uh, just about anything you can do uh, at work. If you can't do it at work, you can, you can do it at home. And we'll talk more about that a bit later. But the key thing is you don't need this. Uh, when I first got started, uh, you did kind of need that. Uh, when I was getting started with networking, you know, the idea of setting up a home lab did sort of require me to go out and have like some spare desktop or an old laptop or something. And I was a poor student. I couldn't really afford and all that extra hardware, and I didn't really have the space for it uh, or the time to set everything up. Uh, but what's great now is you really just need one of these. Uh, whether you have a MacBook, a Windows laptop, even if it's kind of clunky, uh, you can set up a really great home lab and do stuff at home uh, without having a lot of powerful hardware. And just taking a you know, quick snapshot of some of the hardware that I use. So like I personally, I have a MacBook Pro uh, from 2015 with like 500 gigs of storage. It's a, you know, it's a Core i7, 16 gigabytes of RAM. It's fantastic for running VMs. On the other side of things, Tim's uh, satellite, uh, he has a Windows laptop, Toshiba satellite, more storage, an i7 as well, only eight gigabytes of RAM. Uh, and when it comes down to it with the hardware, you don't really need anything all that beefy. You're gonna be limited in some way, but only eventually. So every time you send up a VM, and we'll talk about allocating resources in a little bit for your VMs, but really, as long as you have a spare core on the processor, you'll need one for your actual host operating system and then probably at least one for each of your VMs. If you have enough cores, that's really the only limit on how many VMs you can have running. 
Uh, it's just how much do you want to deal with it. If you don't have enough memory and you're not giving it enough cores, it might be pretty slow. But uh, you can make it work if that's what you have available. So taking a look at the virtualization software. Uh, so on one side you have the, the free Oracle VirtualBox. It's not my favorite. Uh, it's, it is Tim's per preferred one. Uh, but it is totally free. That's what it really has going for it. Uh, my preferred one is VMware Fusion, uh, which is the Mac version. There's VMware Workstation for Windows. Uh, you can get uh, up and running with these pretty cheaply. Uh, and if this is something you're really serious about, I do even recommend looking at like VMware Fusion Pro because it does offer some nice features that you can't get with the normal version. It's a bit more expensive, uh, but you don't really have to upgrade every year. It's just kind of like buying, you know, you buy Windows, you don't have to upgrade every time the new one comes out. You, if you're happy with what you have, you, know, you can stick with it. Then when you start, uh, when you first get started, you kind of want to think about what is the first thing you want to do, and you'll set up your first virtual machine to help you achieve that. More on the blue seam side, you might want to set up something like Security Onion if you're interested in, uh, you know, defense, IDS, firewalls. You'll set up something like that. If you're interested in forensics, the SANS uh, SIFT workstation is really great. You can download their VM and get started with that. Malware analysis, there's Cuckoo. And you can start moving more towards kind of the offensive side with like Samurai WTF that's focused on web, you know, like web hacking, Kali Linux, of course. Uh, but even then, you don't have to go with one of these. You know, there's people who don't use Kali at all. They set up their own Ubuntu and they just install the tools they want. You, know, you can do whatever you want, but you know, these are really great starting solutions. And what I really like about, uh, for example, like, you know, uh, SANS, you know, uh, SIFT and Kali is you can go to the website and you can download pre-made VirtualBox and VMware images. And you just import them and they're up and running, ready to go with the you know, virtualization tools already installed and it's all set. You open it up and everything is configured for you. And then there's a couple of specialized uh, VMs and, uh, and labs that you can go and get. Uh, one of them, if you're interested in ICS and SCADA, is called Cybody Works. Uh, and actually, I'll plug a quick, you know, MySec talk that uh, Kate Vita gave at MySec Jackson uh, a couple of months ago. Uh, it's up on our YouTube channel. You can find it at uh, youtube.com slash MySec group. And she walks through uh, Cybody Works, you know, how to get up and running. Uh, it's what they used last year at the uh, DEF CON uh, ICS Village uh, for their IT, uh, ICS SCADA CTF, which Kate actually won. So, so she walks through, you know, how she won it, what, you know, what happened, uh, and all the tools she used, and, you know, how to get up and running with Cybody. So that's really cool if you're interested in that kind of thing. Point being that if you're interested, in, even if it is something like SCADA ICS, it's possible to set it up at home to get a lab environment you can mess around with, even when it is something that you kind of imagine you would need hardware or special equipment for something like SCADA, you have resources out there. So when you get started building your, kind of your base image, I'll call it, uh, and I'm going to use Kali as an example, uh, you want to set up everything that you know you're going to want that VM to have. And so you can create backups, and you have everything up and running kind of, you know, to your, your, your fresh, you know, perfect, pristine state. And one thing I recommend uh, is combining Kali with, you know, the Kali VM you download and combine it with uh, a script from a guy named Got Milk. And if you were in my talk yesterday, at, also here at 3 o'clock, uh, I talked about Got Milk. It's G0TMI1, the number 1K. Uh, find his GitHub. It's under the same name. You just look for the cow and, and you'll know you got the right guy. He has a repository that he calls OS-scripts. And in there, he has written personalized for him bash scripts that uh, go through and set up Kali exactly how he likes it. You know, installs things for him, configures the Apache you know, web server all the way to installing you know Firefox extensions that he likes. Uh, and from you know some pressure from people that saw that and really liked what he was doing, he's generalized them, added some flags and options. If you don't want, you can have it set up Burp Suite for you and do all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, and he makes those available for free on GitHub. You can run one of those. It'll go through. It takes like an hour or so for it to run through on Kali. But you'll come back. Kali will look completely different. And it'll have a bunch of new tools and, and uh, configuration changes that you might find beneficial. But uh, if you are still learning, 
You know, I also recommend, as I mentioned in my talk yesterday, go through his bash script. It doesn't take that long to look through it and see what it does. Because uh, you might find things after you run it that feel kind of broken or that are unfamiliar to you. And you can go back into that bash script and figure out what happened. Uh, but it does create a, a really nice uh, Kali instance for you to get started. Then you need to uh, think about allocating resources. Like we, we touched on this a little bit earlier. You have a lot of options when you start looking through your, your VM resources and, and additional settings. The key ones are going to be processor cores and memory. Uh, for your base image, the thing you're, you might actually be using to attack other VMs or that you're actually going to be kind of living in and using, I would recommend probably going at least for like two processor cores and two gigs of memory, if you, you know, if that's what, if you're able to spare that on your, your host system. Because that'll give you enough where it's, it's snappy enough that it doesn't feel really sluggish. Uh, if you start cutting back too much, you, you might not enjoy your time using the system. A lot of your attacking, you know, the machines you're just going to be attacking or that just sit off and are going to do nothing but be a target for you to look, you know, for something you to look at, you can give those like 256 megs of memory and one processor core and they'll sit there and be happy uh, unless the creator tells you it's going to need more. There's a couple of other settings to, that's worth uh, being aware of, uh, one being isolation. So for your base image, you might want uh, to have isolation turned off. It's off by default. Uh, but what isolation does is it makes it so that you can't like drag and drop or your, your clipboard won't follow. Uh, so if you have isolation uh, turned off, as it is by default, like I said, you'll be able to do things like switch over to Chrome on your host operating system, Google something, find a command, copy and, you know, copy it, move back to your VM and paste it. Uh, you'll be able to just drag a file off of the VM and drop it on your desktop. If you don't want that to happen for some reason, uh, you can turn on isolation. Encryption, it's worth considering it, uh, depending on how you use that VM. If it's just going to be a vamp VM you're screwing around on and it's living on your computer, it, you know, it's probably not necessary. But if it's going to be something you put on a thumb drive that might have you signed into Google on it, it might have your accounts, uh, you know, or you might end up having information on it that you wouldn't want someone seeing or screwing around with, Turn on encryption so that if someone gets a hold of that VM, they can't uh, root around in it. And then sharing. Sharing is really cool uh, because it may, it's a little bit different from is uh, the isolation setting and uh, what you can do by default. You can set up sharing where it, there's a file on your host system that is shared and mounted on the VM. So you can drag files in there if you, uh, for example, I use this a lot when I was doing the OSCP. So I was living in a VM working in the lab network, uh, you know, doing the exercises and things like that, and I would keep notes and drop them into a folder that I had shared with my MacBook. And then if I ever wanted to reference one of those notes and my VM wasn't running, I didn't have to spin up the VM, get in there and get it, or if I wanted to copy something back and forth, I would just drop it into that folder and instantly it's available to both machines. Networking is something that's uh, worth paying attention to. And that, because we're a little bit green shifted on the screen, that the bottom arrow is supposed to be bright green. You can't really see it here. But what I want to point out here is you need to be careful about how you set up these machines. So with like your, say, your Kali box that you might want an internet connection for, you might want, you want to be able to use Google, you want to be able to download updates, things like that. You can turn on, you know, share with my laptop uh, and, and get, you know, have it share the internet connection of the host operating system. That's fine. But when you start downloading vulnerable machines, which we'll look at in a minute, that are made to be attacked, that are made to have a vulnerability, you don't really want to share that with the internet or, you know, or whatever network you're on. You might not want that showing up, uh, you know, as available. So make that private, you know, to your laptop. Uh, and you can add two networking interfaces to your VM, which is what makes VMs really cool. Because you don't have to go out and buy another network card and, and put it into a slot. You just go open up settings and say, I want another network card. And it's got one. And you can make one for your base image to be shared with your host operating system and one that's host only. And then every other machine you spin up on your computer, you just give it the one NIC, make it host only. It'll get an IP address for the host only network. And then your, uh, like your Kali image can see it. And you can play with it, you can attack it, you can talk to it, do whatever you want, and no one else can see it. And this is uh, 
one example of, of something that gets added with a uh, got milk script uh, to Kali. Uh, but you know, whether you're using that script and Kali or you're going to set up Ubuntu and create your own custom image, uh, I do recommend that if you're doing any kind of red team, you know, playing around with pen testing kind of stuff, uh, look into Foxy Proxy. Uh, because this is really fantastic and as you'll see in a minute, you might even want to install it on your, on your host uh, as well, like, you know, in Firefox. Because what Foxy Proxy does is lets you set up, you know, as you can see here, he's got uh, one for, for burp and wef, one for SSH tunneling. And what you can do is that'll tell Firefox, hey, uh, use this proxy for burp. And then when you don't want to use burp anymore, you just click this little fox icon next to the address bar and turn it off. And then if you want to go back to using burp or you want to switch over to an SSH tunnel or something, you just check, you know, click on the little fox icon again, select the proxy you want, and you're off and running. You don't have to keep going into settings and changing the proxy settings. Uh, so this is really, really handy. Uh, so that's why I wanted to make sure I called it out. Because sometimes I, we, I talk to people about burp and they say, yeah, it's really irritating. I forget to turn the proxy off and then I think my internet connection's down and et cetera, et cetera. It's like, no, you, you can install Foxy Proxy. It makes it really easy. Now, once you have everything set up, you got Foxy Proxy installed, you've run Got Milk Script, you've installed some stuff, you, you're ready to go, you're happy with what you have, take a snapshot. Because if you don't take a snapshot and then later you screw something up, you're going to have to go through the whole thing over again or figure out how to reverse that change. You make a snapshot, you can just at any point go back, click a restore button, and you're back up and running to how it was when you took that snapshot. It's awesome. This is a really, really powerful tool. Uh, so, so use it. And use it even, you can make as many snapshots as you want as long as you have the hard drive space for it. You can keep making snapshots. You're about to make a change to something. You've, you know, you've been working on some projects and, all right, before I make this final change I'm unsure about, snapshot. Make that change, see what happens. Uh, so this is a really great way if you're curious, uh, especially, you know, blue, you know, to give a blue team example, you have a patch or something or some change you want to make to your environment at work or in your home and you're not sure how to interact with things, you can set up a VM, make that change and see what breaks. If it breaks, roll it back, make a different change, rinse and repeat until you're happy with what you, you know, with what you've learned. Another option you have, uh, you know, after you make that snapshot, is you can create a clone of a VM. And what a clone will do is, I mean, it just clones it. It's like copying it. Uh, but what can be kind of neat is you can create linked clones. So you can set up an image that then if you need to, for whatever reason, you want four Windows 7 machines set up in your, in your home lab. And you want them to all be the same. But now you have to go make the change on each and every single one of them. You don't have to do that. You can create linked clones where one clone or three, oh, three clones will all be linked back to one like master clone. You make a change to that master clone, it propagates out and you're good to go. So then once you are happy, you, you know, you have your snapshot, you've created some clones maybe, you're good to go and you're ready to actually start adding stuff to your lab, to actually start doing something, it's actually as easy sometimes as just double clicking. You download a file, you double click it, and VMware, it's already been associated with VMware, it launches, it gets imported, and you're good to go. Sometimes you just right click, open with VMware, open with VirtualBox, and you're good. Not always though, uh, as, you know, as with some of the sites we'll talk about where you can get VMs, you might end up with one of a couple of different files. Uh, you don't have to memorize this, but it does help to be somewhat familiar with, with what these files are. So VDI, is the VirtualBox virtual disk image. And I put that first because this is Oracle's proprietary format. So VMware will not open that. Only Oracle, only Oracle VirtualBox can. And some people will put out uh, CTF images or something like that in VDI format. VMDKs, it's, an, it's the open mach virtual machine disk. This is an open format. So anyone can use it. Uh, VirtualBox and VMware both understand it. And then if you're using VMware, you have a couple of files that you might just start seeing, like, what is, what is this file in this directory? Well, you have VMX or VM, VMware configuration files. You'll have snapshot files, and you start making snapshots. Uh, OVF files you'll see sometimes. Um, that's another open format, the open, open virtualization format. Uh, and then just, I threw this in at the bottom. Um, it, it's unlikely if you're following along with me that you'll use it, but Microsoft does then have their own micro uh, VHD, Microsoft Virtual Hard Disk, that you might see sometimes. 
if you do end up with a VDI image and you uh, would rather be using VMware like I do, uh, not all is lost. I have VirtualBox installed just because this is included with it, uh, a utility called VBox Manage. And what VBox Manage lets you do is easily clone a drive, a virtual disk, but it also has an option that then lets you change the format of that disk. And like I said, VirtualBox understands VMDK, so you can say, please take this VDI image, clone it, and I want the target to be called, you know, whatever.vmdk, and then dash dash format vmdk. Take a few seconds, it'll spit out a vmdk file that you can, that you can then open up in uh, VMware. Once you have all that set up, and now you have this new lab machine you just imported into VMware, you have to actually find it. Uh, and if you're new to this sort of thing, that can be somewhat intimidating uh, because you aren't sure where to start looking. My, one of my favorite ones to use is NetDiscover, uh, which isn't a tool I hear talked about too often. Uh, you say, you load up your Kali VM or Ubuntu or whatever it is, and you fire up your other VM you just added. They're both, you both, you look at your host only network and you see that it's 192.168.110. So you can fire up NetDiscover and say NetDiscover dash R for range, 192.168.110.0 slash 24. A couple of seconds later, it'll say, here's everything we see in that range. And it'll, it'll probably, it'll be you, and it'll be one other thing, most likely. And there's your, you know, there's your other VM, you just found it. Because many of the VMs you might be firing up are meant for you not to touch. They, they just show you a login screen, and they're like a CTF kind of thing, where you're not supposed to know anything about it. Uh, so this is a great way to learn information about it that you wouldn't otherwise have. And if you're interested in the offensive side of things, there's a, uh, a website called Vulnhub that I love, love, love. Uh, and just recently, bringing up Got Milk again, he's one of the, uh, one of the people that maintain that site, along with Rasta Mouse and Null Mode and a couple of other people. Uh, and just recently, actually it was funny enough, it was like the day before the Circle City Con workshop where I first gave this talk, uh, they re they, he did a talk with a couple of other people where they released what he called Stapler, which is a VM uh, that they say is beginner difficulty, but as you can see, he marked it as like question mark, question mark, little winky face. Because uh, supposedly, and here's a little challenge for you, even if you are uh, more experienced with the offensive side of things, uh, there's a very easy way to get root and get the flag on this CTF box to help you learn. But according to Got Milk, there is a much more difficult hidden way that he won't tell anyone about to get root on this box. So as, as I know a couple of people that, are, that have still been working on it, trying to find the hidden way uh, and, you know, to, uh, to get a shell on this, on, on this VM. Uh, but what's cool about this, and the reason I want to call it out, is because he gave this as a presentation. He did his own kind of build a lab workshop that was very uh, offensive focused. Uh, like I said, like a week before we did uh, we did ours, and the day before ours, he released this, and there's a link to a PDF version of their presentation where he walks through what is VulnHub, uh, how to get started, come, some of the things that we've already talked about today, and then also goes into exactly step-by-step -step, uh, how to uh, own this machine. So if you're totally new to things, uh, that can help you out. Yes? VulnHub. Yep, yep, it's like, like vulnerable, like vulnerable hub. Yep, so, th so there's a couple of others. Uh, yes, there's vulnhub.com. And there's a couple of others, uh, that I would recommend checking out, especially if you're, if you're a beginner. Um, and what's really great about this is there's something there for, for everything that you might be interested in. There's ones that are just funny, that are just, you know, like fun CTFs, they use riddles, or they're just puzzles, they're not even really, they don't rely on you really having technical knowledge. If you can connect to a port, you can find the machine, it'll give you a puzzle, you answer a question, it gives you a flag, and you move, you know, you move on deeper into the, you know, into the machine. Uh, some of them, like BrainPan, will, are really awesome for exploit development. If you're interested in that, uh, you know, like the first one I think starts off with a simple buffer overflow, and you can work your way up from there. Uh, there's, there's a series called Pwn OS that, uh, a whole array, it's basically kind of a more standard vulnerable image. Here, hey, we have a vulnerable version of this operating system, you figure out how to attack it, uh, as well as Vulnerable OS. 
Uh, Chiopteryx has a bunch of different interesting challenges. D-Ice is great. Uh, some of the dev random ones are funny. There's one called Sleepy that's like seven dwarves themed a little bit. Um, so you can have a lot of fun with these. Now, let's say you are in a situation where you don't really have the hardware to run a bunch of VMs, uh, or you just, you don't, you know, you don't, you're really kind of intimidated by VMware, what have you. There's other things you can do. Uh, or maybe you're just not interested, you know, because there is a lot of, uh, I realize a lot of the more interesting stuff that, like, I know I get excited about are offensive focused. Uh, but there's other things you can do at home that's lab, you know, that's in a lab that doesn't require a bunch of hardware that you can play with. Uh, or just using hardware you'll already have. Uh, to begin with, there's, uh, OWASP makes a project called Bricks. And Bricks is really cool because they do make a VM for this. And I'll call it out if you, uh, look for the OWASP Broken Web App Project, BWAP. And they make a VM that has Bricks and a whole bunch of other stuff that they've put out over the years in a VM with ton, dozens and dozens of web apps that'll teach you, here's, this is the command injection section. Here's a bunch of web apps we created that have command injection. Go find it. This is SQL injection. This is this. This is that. Uh, so if you're interested in web app or AppSec, awesome. That's an awesome tool. But Bricks, let's say you don't, you don't want to set up a VM or you're just in a situation, you're at work, you want to, you know, you want to do this for, for training at work, but you don't, you know, you can't set up a VM. Bricks you can download and it just, it's just a directory on your computer. It starts up its own, you start up a little, its own little web server. It uses your host OS because it's not going to do anything to you. Uh, you know, you can sit there and own all these web applications and it's not going to hurt your host OS. And all you have to do is you can just use Burp in a web browser. All, you know, all free stuff, download the free version of Burp on your computer and fire up your own web browser on that host operating system with bricks running. And you can attack those web applications. No, you know, virtualization required. Uh, to even take a further step away from using anything, you know, on your computer other than Burp is over the wire. Over the wire is really cool because all of their challenges are SSH and web based. So you go there, arm yourself with a terminal with SSH and, uh, either, you know, whatever your favorite proxy is, whether you want to use OWASP Zap or Burp Suite, you go to over the wire. And they have all these challenges for you to work on from like the base level one is called Bandit. And you'll SSH into a server. They give you the username and password. And there's a challenge there. You'll have to use grep to find a password. You'll have to use find. You have to use different Linux commands. So if you're new to Linux, it's a great way to learn. It'll challenge you in interesting ways to find stuff on their, on their server. And you'll graduate to the next one and the next one. They have a, like a, a list they give you as a suggested way to work through all their challenges. And eventually you'll get to one um, that is uh, all web-based where you use burp and some of those get really really tricky but there's also really great walkthroughs available online and I got asked at Circle CityCon and I mentioned the walkthroughs is do I think walkthroughs are cheating I actually write some of the walkthroughs for, for Volnhub I, I think it's a lot of fun and I write them because I want people to read them not really to check their answers so to speak but because that's how I learned a lot to get started on the offensive side of things was because if I got stuck some, on something, if there's a tool I don't know about or an exploit I don't know about or some service that I don't realize is vulnerable, I'm not going to suddenly understand that information by staring at it for weeks and depriving myself of information already available to me. Because there is a thing on, on your web browser when you look at those walkthroughs called the scroll bar. And you can, only, you can go down just far enough to get a hint to move forward and then step away. You don't have to read the whole thing. And I would keep those open in a browser tab and work on it, work on it. And if a couple hours had gone by, I'm like, I haven't made any progress. I'd go and look at it. And usually it'd be something like, I have, I had no idea that was something available to me. And then you're, you're, you sprint for a couple hours and then you're back to maybe where you hit a wall. So definitely use those. Uh, and there's a bunch of them available for over the wire and, and bricks as well. Just Google it with like what you're stuck on. You'll, you'll find a bunch of blog posts and things like that. Uh, but then even stepping further back from there, uh, there's PFSense and like OpenWirt. If you're interested in networking and firewalls and you do have some old hardware or, you know, a, a router that you wouldn't necessarily mind bricking if you make a mistake, you can, you can play around with some, you know, OpenWirt, you know, uh, tomato, play around with, you know, enhancing your router, play around with PFSense, set PFSense up in a virtual machine 
and route stuff through it. You know, pl you know, play with the firewall. There's stuff you can do at home. I, you know, personally, when I, uh, I was in a situation where I'd, I just bought a house several years ago and I was still doing a lot of networking at the time. And I was interested in wiring up my house. And that became kind of a lab in itself of figuring out how do I, wa how do I run cat 5e through this house? How do I wire it up? How do I do everything? And then how do I organize this network afterwards? It became its own kind of awesome project. And, you know, that was just a physical thing that I could do at home that if you don't, if you're interested in that sort of thing and you don't get to run cable, uh, or it's not something you necessarily want to do as a job, you can do it once and even if it's just running Cat5 like around your apartment, uh, you know, setting up your own like wired network can, you know, can be a pretty beneficial thing depending on where you are in your career. And that's, uh, we actually finished really quickly, so I'm, I'm going to open this up for questions. Yes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so a lot of people do still set up like physical networks uh, for them to play. I mean, and you can look at, you can do a lot of cool things with that, right? Like just even look at the CTF across the hall. Um, so what you can do is, is really a lot of the same stuff we, we talked about here. You could set up a network, uh, and with that sort of situation, you could even set up things like being able to pivot, uh, you know, up from the offensive side of things. You, you know, you attack one machine and then that machine is, um, scale back a little bit. You can set up like kind of nested networks, right? So where you could almost set up like a DMZ, that you can attack with then, you know, through your switches and, you know, additional switches and routers have then machines behind that DMZ. You know, so where you have to attack the, the first, uh, the machines in that DMZ and then pivot through them to attack the other machines. Um, setting up different, you know, like, well, you can set up one as a web server, one as something else. Uh, so, I mean, really all the same opportunity is there for you with maybe a couple of, of additional opportunities because it's physical. Uh, but I would say get started with whatever you're interested in. You can use those machines to, uh, you know, to spin up that web server, whatever it is that, that catches your, your eye. Does that answer the question? Oh, sure, yeah, I mean, it, it, unfortunately, the, only, the best way I can think of the answer is it's really going to depend on what you're interested in, but yeah, like, you go ahead, you know, uh, you can simulate attacks, uh, simulate different types of web traffic, and yeah, sniff that traffic and then go through the PCAPs afterwards to see what you can see. Um, it's really, there, there's endless opportunity there. So it would depend on exactly, like, what you're interested in at the time, and then since it's your lab, you could make changes to it at any moment. And, you know, scrap it and start over with something new. Yes. Yeah, so uh, that, that's a fair question and, and worth pointing out. And it's actually something I'll even say that VulnHub is aware of, uh, because if someone's creating a new vulnerable VM, it's pretty easy to, I'll create a vulnerable web app and that's the way in. Um, I'll set up a WordPress site that's really old and, and that's the way in. Uh, and they're aware of that and they're, they are, actually that community is making a, a pretty concerted effort right now to try to get out more different types, you know, exploit development and more like basic stuff uh, so that people can learn a, a more, a greater variety of things. Um, but yeah, as far, but obviously none of them, a lot of those are CTF based, uh, so they don't really mimic an, an enterprise network. Uh, so you can definitely absolutely set up, uh, you know, exchange or, you know, mail servers, what have you, if you want to mimic a, you know, a specific network. Uh, the one difficulty that you might run into there is just getting um, it's not entire, it's super easy to get Windows and all that set up unless you have access maybe like an MS, MSDN subscription or, or something like that. Um, 
but it's it's something I've played around with, and, and you can use a virtual lab for that as well, as long as you can run you know multiple machines on your laptop or your desktop. You can absolutely spin up, you know, here's an exchange server, here's a couple of Windows boxes. Um, and that's where like a lot of times with like link clones and making clones of machines can help because okay, I want to set up several Windows boxes and so I'm gonna set up yeah, Windows server, you know, whatever I have on six machines, and then I'll make one exchange server, one this, one that, and and play with play around with them there. Yeah. Sure. Um, as far as if you're if you're looking for anything physical, uh, I'm often told, and this is something that I, I really need to take advantage of because I live in a college town, and so do you. Uh, is is university reclamation? Um, you know, they'll get rid of switches and old desktops and servers a lot uh, that you can pick up for, for basically pennies compared to like what you're getting. Um, you know, even as far as things like actually full blown like Cisco switches. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've seen people before say like, oh, I really want to get into networking or what, you know, I'm trying to get my CCNA, I really want some way where I can play with a Cisco switch, but there, I don't have thousands of dollars to buy this switch that I want to put. Sometimes the universities are literally throwing them away. You pay them 50 bucks and you get <laughs> a really expensive piece of hardware that you can play around with. Uh, but that's, I, yeah, I remember when I, especially if you're a student, I, I remember being in classes with professors coming in saying, I have literally like a barn full of old servers that I'm trying to get rid of. Uh, so you know, keep a lookout for uh, situations like that um, and know that maybe you'll have to fix it up a little bit, uh, depending on maybe something's broken or it's, you know, doesn't have any video out or something, you'll have to add a video card or some, you know, something like that. But uh, I, would, I would definitely say looking for like, yeah, university reclamation or, or just school districts, there's a school district near you. Um, you know, that might be getting rid of old desktops. Uh, they probably won't be the best. They'll probably be several years, you know, more and more outdated. Uh, but uh, they'll be really cheap. And you're setting up something like a, like a, uh, you have the room for a, a physical network. They definitely get the job done. Might be able to run a couple of virtual machines for you. Any other questions? Yeah. Do you happen to have, I assume you don't have it with you, it's probably like a problem you ran into. Because uh -huh. it's, yeah, it's not a problem I've had, but um, I'll say yeah, if you had it with you, we could take a look at it. Yeah, it's not a problem I've run into my, myself. Yes? Mm-hmm. Um, they'll, uh, typically, uh, I mean, if you set them up to grab a DHCP address and they have, you know, say your host only network, they'll grab it from, from the pool of addresses available. VMware will assign them one. No, it shouldn't. I mean, you can, and you can even go in, um, just as a, throwing it out there, you can actually even go in and change the MAC address for a virtual machine, um, which can be kind of fun. You can make it look like it's an NSA, you know, owned by the NSA or something like that, uh, and and make a, a lot of changes like that to to the VM. If you start digging into some of the the hardware changes you can make, but no, as in general, you can spin up as many as you want, and it'll keep handing out uh, you know, VMware will keep handing out VMware MAC addresses and IP addresses, no problem. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Um, these are just easier solutions to get a hold of, and there's a lot of walkthroughs out there. Um, personally, I prefer VMware. Um, like I said, and Tim preferred VirtualBox. Uh, but I mean, I mean, there's yeah, there's lots of options like that available. There's no real, you know, I wouldn't tell you not to use it. It's just what what I got started with and what I really like. And like VirtualBox especially is, I mean, it's it's a free download, so it's something that can a lot of people can just get up and up and running with really easily, at least to get started. Anything else? All right, thanks everyone. <laughs>